What's up, guys? Ricardo Amendolia here with episode 18 of the Ricardo Balea podcast. Thank you, everyone that's been watching. We had a really cool episode last episode with uh, Sean G. Ribeiro. And uh, before we get to today's guest, I kindly ask that you click the like button. I know that I say this every week and it might get annoying, but I appreciate all your likes. And also, if you have not subscribed to the channel already, hit the subscribe button. I don't know if I'm pointing to the right thing, but please do so. Please share the video and uh, let's get things rolling, guys. It, it's a great honor for me to have a, a friend of mine, uh, you know, a guy that kind of had some similar paths as, as, as mine, similar circles in the jiu-jitsu world. And, uh, you know, he's one of the owners and head instructors at Meraki Jiu-Jitsu. I'm talking to Mr. Jason Hunt. How are you today? Oh, man, I'm doing well. Thank you. As good as we can in, in these crazy times, so. Yeah, so I, I mentioned, you know, you're in Meraki, you're in the Brentwood, uh, you know, uh, Beverly Hills kind of area. We, we mentioned a second ago, you're down the street from the OJ scene, but uh, <laughs> yeah, well, down the street, yeah, down the street. Yeah. How, how, how has things been for you um, dealing with the corona, dealing with some of the other insanity that followed? Have you guys been able to train? Is it training back? Like, what's going on at Meraki Jiu Jitsu right now? Uh, so we've been two days open for the guidelines of LA County. Okay. And, uh, it's a very small class. So we're only allowed to have 10 people at a time. So we've been going back and forth for a couple of weeks preparing for this and trying to figure out what's best. And what we came up with the first two days, which uh, we got to change because it didn't really work as best we thought. So it's 10 people and we're only doing 30 minute classes. So the kids class is one hour so they get 30 minutes 30 minutes so that everybody can get in fundamentals 30 minutes 30 minutes and 30 minutes so we have three 30 minute classes to make sure that everybody has their slot and then the same for the advanced three three and three okay um man it, it, it was like yeah nobody really knew what to do how to act shut touch not touch go here maybe and then two minutes after that it was Everything in the air, everybody's training, grabbing each other. It was like nothing ever happened. And it's like, no, wait, we got to hold that. Man, just, <laughs> okay, do what you want. Like, I don't know what to say to you. And, and a lot of cleaning and a lot of wiping down. And, uh, man, people in Orange County have been training for, like, a lot longer. And then, you know, Tanner Rice was in California. He's been open, like, and, and we haven't had any complaints or nobody said anything to him. So we didn't really know what to do or what to think. And, then the riots were happening down the street and then next to the building. And that was really scary. We didn't know what to expect. And uh, Monday, tomorrow will be our third day. And, and, and we're going to change it to where we're going to have three people for five stations. So that okay. you can have like a round robin. And uh, same thing. We did a lot of Zoom. Like, man, Zoom it was the savior yep. of the corona, you know? Yeah. Um, which was great. So instead of doing class, we're just having them come in and working on what we went over for three months and, uh, and, and we're just kind of letting them, and we're there to ask questions and stuff, but man, the guys are having so much fun. They're, everybody's really out of shape. So it's just like, get in there and enjoy yourself. Have fun. Yeah. Let's come back to regular class when everybody starts to get more familiar and the restrictions start to light up a little bit and we can somewhat get back to normal. And, you know, it's, it's a, Every day is a different day. Yeah, with the corona, I think here in California. Yeah, do you do you find that uh, even though the, you know, the class format has changed, that the students are pretty appreciative and stoked to be there, or are they, you know, kind of complaining, or what's the feedback been like? Man, nobody's complained. Everybody's really grateful, but everybody's also nice. really scared. And I, yeah. I'm, I'm scared also, so it's like you know, I, I'm scared. You know, I'm nervous. I don't want to get sick, just like the next guy does. So. I think everybody's, some people were like really anxious to get back. Some people are being a little bit more cool, but everybody's communicating, which is cool. Like we have nice. a group that every student that we try to get into it is talking like, hey, how's everything? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I have my grandparents or my wife doesn't want or. So it's, it's still like, take your time. We're going to do this until it's safe. And, you know, everybody. We have a good student base, which is cool. So thank God that everybody's nice. really cool and communicated. 
Nice. Um, so, uh, you know, I got to ask you, how did you get hooked up with Kenny? And tell me a little bit about how um, Meraki kind of came about. I mean, I know you got Isaac uh, teaching there as well. And a lot of other top level guys come by Meraki to come and train with you and Kenny. Um, I, I, you know, I just, I'm just very interested to, fu- to, to understand how that whole transpired, you know, cause I know you will get to that later on, but you know, you train with some other guys and Gracie Baja and Atos, but uh, how did you end up with Ken Flo? And ha- tell me about the origins of Meraki. Um, man, it's funny enough. Cause you, you know, Sean, Sean Williams, great dude, amazing instructors, you know, yep. you know like, uh, everybody goes at night we would go train with Sean because man, you know, Sean had his school, Dane Molina was in there and Kenny would train in there and same, everybody would come through town and go to Sean's. So on Wednesday nights, everybody would meet up at Sean. So me and Kenny would train and, and see each other there. And I first met Kenny whenever we were at Anderson Silva's camp uh, for the very first Chel Sonnen fight. Uh, Hamon was here and I was with Hamon and we were in the camp and I met Kenny during that time. And, you know, all this train, blah, 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 nothing serious. And we got done training one night. We were in the parking lot. Just, man, you know how nice it would be to have our own school, you know, blah, blah, blah. I had this idea. You had this idea. Man, no joke. No, two weeks later, we're signing a lease in this building that we're in today. And it nice. was just like, oh, I guess it's for real now. We got to go. <laughs> so um, that's literally how it started. It was just, we just were in the parking lot talking, uh, you know, Kenny's, Kenny, 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 you know, is retired and stuff, and, mm-hmm. and he really loves jiu-jitsu. And, and so we were just talking about how having a school talking about, you know, pure jiu-jitsu and, and not having it a political because he has friends, I have friends, uh, rather, rather than opening a, a, a name of a team in jiu-jitsu. Like, let's do something slightly different. Yeah. More like Studio 540, you know, is kind of the um, inspiration. And... Uh, he was like, yeah, man, I'd really like that. I don't, you know, I want to have my friends come here and, you know, we want to have high level training, but not be associated so that we can have like uh, anybody come in and not have to worry about the politics of them being in a mm. school to share jujitsu. Nice. Yeah. The, the concept, you know, yeah. um, and then, and then we came up with a name and I sat inside here when we got it and kind of designed the school and, and it was, it just kind of one by one by one by one. And, Oh man, we're open now. Oh, it was kind of, you know, I was scared. I was like, oh man, I have no idea, you know, like how this is going to go. And, and that's literally the direction it went from mm-hmm. Sean Williams Academy in the parking lot. Wow. And, and what is it? I got to ask, what, what's Meraki? What does that mean? Is there uh, some Japanese meaning behind that? It doesn't sound know, Brazilian. It's, uh, it's Greek, you know? It oh, means okay. The same thing in Japan as it means in, in Japanese and Greek. Uh, it just means leave your soul and creativity within your work. Nice. So it kind of, it kind of the, the name really kind of fits the, the idea behind it. You know, it's a, it's a, we want it to be a creative environment, rather like a creative space rather than a jiu-jitsu academy. Nice. So the name kind of fit that, you know, bring your creativity within. And, you know, jiu-jitsu is obviously very creative, especially now, you know. Yeah. So Absolutely. it just, man, it, it just all kind of puzzled together. Awesome. So, um, you know, I've, I've known about Meraki for a few years and, uh, you know, you and I, like I said before, we've had some, you know, similar friends in the jiu-jitsu world and and you're a guy that I've seen, um, kind of behind the scenes on a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people, a lot of groups, a lot of training, even events. And the first time I saw you was at ADCC 2009 when you were commentating from Barcelona, and man, I remember the worst you, thing ever. I know I do like, <laughs> I like man. I look at that. I'm just gonna turn my air conditioner. I man, I had, I look at that now like you're an idiot. Like Jay, like you had, I had no idea what I was doing. Somebody gave me a microphone and. But you know what? It's it's at that time. You know, we it doesn't matter because we needed. Um, you know, we needed some insight. We needed some good commentary. There wasn't a lot of commentary like there is now. There was a lot of, you know, higher level guys like there is nowadays. Um, and, and I think you did a great job, but one of the things that I, I, I really realized was like, you had a lot of insight, um, uh, especially to some newcomers, which is like Hoffa, uh, Mendez, you were, you know, I noticed you were talking a lot about Leo Vieira. Um, so your, your knowledge of the, the guys behind the scenes was pretty diverse. So, you know, speaking on that, 
Um, I want to hear a little bit about your background on, on how you kind of, um, you know, got into jujitsu, some of the circles you trained with and, and, you know, how you kind of ended up, you know, commentating ADCC and then to where you are now, you know, I know, um, you're, you, you're one of the first Americans to go down to Rio Claro. I mean, how the hell does that happen? You know, were you training somewhere in the States and then you just decided to hop on the plane to go to Brazil? Tell me the story of Jason Hunt in Brazil and Rio Claro and the early beginnings of Atos Jiu Jitsu. Oh man. So funny enough, 2007, you know, as the worlds came to, to LA for the first time, it was really into America. And before that, as, as we're old, you know, yep. um, we were competing in high school gyms with wrestling mats and, you know, we thought we were good. Um, I had a really good friend that I was training with. His name is Jared Nathanson. Um, man, we competed a lot and we won a lot, but it was like, we weren't fighting anybody. Like, uh, nobody was really training jiu-jitsu, but you know, so 2007 came, we competed, um, man, got destroyed. Okay. Like destroyed. And, uh, Lucas and Leo Vieira, Lucas Leach, Leo Vieira stayed in America. As you remember, you opened a yep. school in La Habra. Yeah. I think that's Lucas's original school, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, yep. yeah. With Chris, Chris Franco. Chris, Chris Franco, the Ruka guy. I remember yeah, him. Had, had really helped out a lot of people. Um, so when that happened, it was like, man, I, I, I want to know what those guys were doing, you know? Like, mm. at Home Lo Bajal did a flying triangle in 2007. Fake Koji to a, you know, jiu-jitsu we've just never seen before. For me, yeah. just never seen it, you know? Um, so Leo opened the school. I went to go take a private with Leo Vieira. Uh, it was amazing, you know. We trained with tennis balls. It's the first time he's like, here, tennis <laughs> balls, we're training. You know, it was great. I did, listen, I'm going to cut you off because in 2003, I did a private with Leo, and he busted out the tennis balls to, <laughs> to, to, to practice guard recovery. To, to the, the idea was to not grab the gi, but to push off with frames to recover your guard. So I, I know exactly where you're coming from, and it was it was a great – Private lesson, but continue your story. Great. Yes. Still to this day, I use that concept. Like, man, the guy's a genius. Like, so yep. I never understood body weight, and you know, I, I I just used a lot of strength for sure. You know, like just oh man, just pressure, but no pressure, just strength because I had no pressure. So that's when I figured out, like, oh man, your body, and it was great. It was one of the best practices I've ever done. It was amazing. He's such a lovely guy, and he really like cared that I was understanding. Mm. So then I started to train with Lucas all the time because Lucas didn't have a lot of training partners in America. I was brown butt at the time. So I would drive two hours every day to go train with Lucas. And it was different because it was a jujitsu that, that was for real, you know, like training before in America, man, it was a hobby. You weren't able to really spend that kind of time with competitors because nobody really did it for their life. Like in Brazil. So here it's like, you go to work, you go to train. You know, it's yeah. like more of a hobby, fun kind of thing. Very few people were like really doing it. Like Eddie Bravo and a few guys were like, that was what they did. And, and again, you know, they're, they're, that's why they were that good. You know, they were yep. doing it for a long time. So I started training. Andre Galval came, started his MMA career. Rented a place in, um, man, it's funny, a little tiny house. Sarah, his daughter was just very tiny at the time. And, and Angelica had... Uh, man, San Pedro. So I would go pick up Lucas to drive to, or go pick up Andre to drive to Lucas so that he could do his jujitsu training while he was training for his MMA. Mm -hmm. And, uh, luckily for me, I formed a really close relationship with Andre because I was with him every day. I was picking him up every day, going there, trying to train with him a little bit, but it was not really me training with him. It was just getting killed, not knowing <laughs> anything like you know, I really didn't understand anything then, if I'm honest with myself. So then, at the time was a team, and then they 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 started to split. You know that then Hill Carl started. So Hamon came over to help Andre in the Worlds in 2008. Hamon came over. So it was like he stayed, helped Andre. I was training with him. I was driving to San Diego because that's where Andre was. And um, Kevin Howell, as, as everybody yep. knows, and another amazing guy. Yeah. We were training with them constantly because that's when Andre was doing the book. 
And um, one thing led to another. It was like, hey, Jay, uh, we don't have a school here. So you're going to need to move to Brazil if you want to keep training with Hamon. Because hmm. Hamon lives in Brazil, and it's in a very small city. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Uh, Brazil, beautiful, you know, the women, the this, everything that you talk about, Acai, but Hill Claro is not that. <laughs> I went far from the beach. I'll never forget it. I'm always like, Jason, get ready, like really get in shape because you have no idea, like, what you, you have no idea. Okay, whatever, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Fly to Sao Paulo. We get in a bus. I have a big bag. And we're in a bus from Sao Paulo, three and a half hours northeast into Hill Claro. Real Claro. Get off the bus, go to the house, small home, drop my bag straight to the academy. And man, it was tiny. And it was hot. And everybody on that map was really good. <laughs> everybody there was yep. world champion. And in, in every belt that they, in whatever belt they were, every single person had won the worlds at a belt level there, except myself. Even the blue belts, I remember. I remember at that time, sorry to cut you off, but like guys like Ronaldo, Conjito, uh, Danilson, Beliscari, um, you know, a lot of new up and comers. You know that 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 place, from what I saw, you know, the the brick wall, the small, you know, mat um, was just a room full of killers. And you know, one of our mutual friends, uh, Gilbert Dorinha, was telling me a lot about the training there recently on the this podcast and. Obviously, Hoff and Guy told me a lot, but uh, what what did you find was the, the the one of the biggest differences in the training, um, despite from the technical level? What was it that they were doing that um, that you just didn't see in in America at the time? Man, for me, it was the camaraderie of the team, you know, and and the and the dedication of there wasn't outside influences like. There was nothing like, oh, let's go to the beach and skip training or let's mm. go get some food and skip training. There was none of that there. So uh, you had Hamon Lemos, who um, for me is like you genius. Know, it's the yeah. guy is just not only is he that good in jujitsu himself, but he he was coaching but not training so the difference in america is most of the guys that when they come to america they're still training to keep their dreams of being world champions and so they're training themselves also trying to train a team hamon didn't train he he literally would coach and dissect and and stop you in the middle of the training to fix this script this script's bad for you do this stop here do this do this no you're not doing this this is how you train we had like the training schedule was man. First, the mats were like grounded up tires with a tarp and holes in them. It hurt. It, the walls you didn't stop. Like the wall was just man. Hit the brick and keep going. Yeah. You know? So we would get there at nine in the morning. Two hour training. So first thing he would go over three positions. We would drill those three positions. So we would probably drill them between just your just getting the motion down, getting it timed, then speed drills and and then doing it specific training. Probably first morning would be 20 times each side, 20 times each side. So that's 80, 20 times each side, 120. So about 160 to 180 repetitions mm. before training of three techniques that were the concept of you know what jujitsu. You know, it's like uh, if we were passing the guard or the guard. It was, okay, this is the beginning, and this is where it leads. If he adjusts, this is where you adjust. If he adjusts, this is where you adjust. And it just kept going. Mm -hmm. So 9 to 11, we would do drills and then train. 11 to 12, uh, Hafing Gi's cousin, Tiago Mendes, amazing guy, went and learned uh, physical training and everything and, and had everything inside the academy to do our circuits. So right after hard training, straight to physical training. <laughs> no more training back then, you know. Straight after that, we would go eat, come back for 3 o'clock. Same drills at 9 happened at 3. Same 
repetition. So now we've done another 160 to 180 reps of the, of, so now we're way past 400 reps of what the position. Yep. And the training wasn't as hard. Hamon would pick the training to where, okay, More. now you can only train this many, like less, less time and black belts couldn't train with black belts. So it was more like just attack, attack, attack. Right. Um, and then the rest of us, you know, I wasn't black belt at the time I was brown. So it was still like, I would train with everyone. Um, and then you'd go home, eat, sleep for an hour and come back at eight o'clock, eight to 10 o'clock, same position we did nine, uh, three. And now again, and then the students would come in. So it wasn't the team, the competition team, really. It was more like the people from work and, but they were training the same. Like they were, they were monsters. Like there was guys in there that were, that never trained. Yep. Man, they were, they were good. Um, and then we would do that Monday through Friday. Saturday we'd wake up, we'd go to, we'd go to the academy and we would run. And then after we'd run, we'd all just sit in the academy and that's where Wi-Fi was. So everybody would sit around and get on Facebook and, you know, start doing their thing. And then uh, Sunday was wake up, church, uh, barbecue. Nice. And then repeat. Repeat Every the day. whole week. That's yeah. And, and, you know, you, you one of the things you said was the speed drills uh, and just the drilling and the repetition of the, of the techniques. That was something I know for, for our end, um, you know, you and I were kind of chatting beforehand and I, I felt like, um, learning from guys like Hafan Gi, you know, our, our academy is affiliated with Hafan Gi and just being able to drill so much. We never, my friend, uh, who owns the academy, PJ O'Sullivan and I, like where we trained before, we never understood the importance of drilling. We never really, we, we, we kind of saw it as a hassle, but we never saw the benefits because nobody had really taken the time to um, really demonstrate that to us. You know, we saw a lot of technical jujitsu and a lot of beautiful jujitsu that was that we learned from seminars and people coming to teach us. But as far as the drilling methodology, the speed drills, I still remember Guy, you know, yelling at us. He's like, "Drills, but fast. Drills, but fast." You know what I mean? Like, just constantly, like, just and, and it's like you cannot stop. You know, and then it just you develop the speed and fluidity in your passing that i you know i i just it's amazing like i feel like there was like you know i feel like in myself there was like different levels and um it's like when i started jujitsu um then when i first started training you know kind of regularly with a black belt and then it was the hafan gi era and then it's just been that era since then you know understanding yeah, could do the same i thought i knew jujitsu yeah now i went to hill claw and yeah and again, it's like they're saying, you know, the guys like Guy and Hoffa the, and, and Hamon, you know, and I like to say this because, again, my experience there was even with the drills, Hamon was fixing your, man, you're doing the drill wrong. You have to do it right. It has to be like this. You have to move your foot, your hand right here every single time and do it very fast so that it's perfect and perfection constantly. Mm -hmm. And and you can see it in Guy and Hoffa. You can see, especially Guy. Guy is a, Guy is precise like yeah he's a precision person hoffa's more you know hoffa plays more but gi is just like perfect um yeah. but then gi also gives that information for hoffa so it's like a you know a lot of people don't give the credit i think where yes gi is a four-time world champion but he is also a genius like right? he's he yeah. studies like man even Hill claro we would train he would go home and watch everybody's matches and wow. come back and be like, so-and-so does this. This is what I will do. And man, I'm not going to sit here forever and talk stories about how I feel like those guys were so good is because after a training, because everybody there is at the highest level. Everybody was there. Like I said, everybody. Danielson, Blue Belt. Man, he gave Hoffa a good time at Blue Belt then. Yeah. Yeah. Like, my first training ever in Brazil was Danielson. He killed me. I didn't even know what to think. I'm like, man, brown, blue belt, not whatever. I'm just, oh. <laughs> little and guy too. Them, not they they yeah, just not a, They're like, welcome. Yeah. And then I was, that was that's when I was like, oh man, I kind of want to go home. Like this is for real. Like I don't, I don't know. This was like, this isn't what I thought it was gonna be. <laughs> um, but after the trainings, people, everyone would sit around, 
together as a group. And I mean, I'm like Gilbert Burns, Bruno Frazado, Hoffa, Guy, Durinho, Calasanz, Guto Campos, Denilson, Rojadino, uh, Tiago Mendez, and then um, Eduardo is their other cousin. He's amazing at Jiu Jitsu. He just never came to compete, but man, the guy is phenomenal in Jiu Jitsu, Hoffa Guy's cousin. Uh, and then you had um, Sigunch and if I'm forgetting somebody's name, I apologize. You know, uh, Orlando Zanetch was there at the time, where a lot of people don't know who Orlando is. But they would talk. And, hey, man, how'd you do that? How'd you do this? How'd this? Boom, 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 boom. Next thing you know, there's another drilling session after training to fix one position that Gilbert and Hoffa did. So mm -hmm. now all the black belts are there. With us, we just sat there and kind of listened. You know, we didn't really have much to say, if I'm honest. But we'd listen, and it would just be like, Oh, then it would flourish into this position. Yeah. Next training, they're drilling that. Like, that position, yeah. Like crazy. And and then it evolves again. And it evolves again. And then 50-50 came up. And then uh, an armbar came up for Gilbert. And, man, like so many things just started to to pop up. Yeah. You know, and that's what, that's what I feel was different is is – the the way the it's such a small place and like Gilbert and Bruno lived in an apartment that was the size of this office but I'm talking that's the kitchen the shower the bathroom the living it's just like this is this is what they lived in it was not good Hafe and Guy tiny house right next to the academy you know I lived with Hamon small house Hamon and his wife so luckily for me I got to live with Hamon every day I woke ate breakfast night so I learned just over dinner, we'd be talking. And, um, so nobody had like this amazing life. It was, it was home to eat and the academy was life. Yeah. Jiu Jitsu was the life for them. You know, for me, it's a little different. Yeah. I was older, obviously, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't competing at the level that they were, you know, so um, you can see why now you can see like their fruits and, and everybody that came out of there, everybody that came out of Rio Claro has accomplished something. Yep. And, you know, uh, and, and one of the things I wanted to ask you was, um, you know, aside from the drilling concepts and the hard training, we talked about that. Um, what do you, what technical, you know, revelation do you feel that you kind of took from them, um, and, and still kind of utilize this to this gate to this day? Because like a lot of guys know you as this like you know, uh, you're a very good coach in your own regard. I know a lot of top black belts come to you. So what was it technically that they showed you? I know that speaking to Hafangi, one of the things that they told me was that Hamon Lemos helped them learn how to think about positions. What specifically do you feel like, or what position or, or how to think about jujitsu really rubbed off on you from that training environment? Uh, there's a system. There is a system that what you would call the octo system. Okay. Right? Um, the passing system. Everybody passes the same at octos, really. There's a whole system, but the guards vary throughout the throughout the team, and that's mm -hmm. what I love about Hamon. Because Hamon, I showed up in Hill Claro playing half guard. I'm a bigger guy. Hamon yeah. looked at me and said, "That's Gilbert Burns. Same body, same body. You're going to do what he does. Got it? Okay." No choice. Right. Yeah, it's like okay, so that's how me and Gil became so close because we yeah. were, I was with him all the Training, time. Training, yeah. You know, and like that's what Hamon taught. He taught me, and I think he taught everyone that it's like every body type has a slightly different adjustment. So you can't teach the technique; you have to teach the concept, and the person needs to get the technique to fit his body structure and his mind to hand. Because my mind, the hand is different than uh, clearly gear hopper. You know what I'm saying? Like just as mm -hmm. a reference, like, yeah. They think is like you can't you you can't do that unless you're in their head. So Hamon would teach you to be like, okay, here's the position. This is the starting point. This is where you need to end. Make your body fluid and precise. Get to this position. Once you get there, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And you drill it so many times is the minute he makes one movement, you know where is 
So if you're at one, two, now you already know where three is. And then you go to three and he turns, you know where four, five, six to the finish is. You already, you already know your lane and your line of this is where I'm going to finish, you know? Mm -hmm. And again, it was like Hamon was there to walk. Everybody's training. He's not training at all. He would train only sometimes at night, you know, like, but in the daytime, he was watching and studying and saying, no, you have the wrong grip. Your grip needs to be here, not here. Your body's like this. So you're trying to get here where you need to leave yourself a little bit more room because your body doesn't fit. And he would adjust everybody personally. And that's what I try to take away. It's like, is that system of like, teach the concept of the position. And after you teach it, let the person understand how his body is going to make it work for his jujitsu. Mm -hmm. But understands the concept of you need to block this, you need to put pressure here, and let the position flow of how it's going to fit for your brain and your hand. So not so not specifically the technique, but you know, you you said it multiple times, and I, I I feel like we're speaking the same language. It's the position. It's understanding the the position and not just doing the technique. You know, um, one of the things that I always say was, um, you know, I remember being taught how to pass De La Hiva. I remember being taught De La Hiva sweeps kind of prior to training with Hoffa and Guy, but I didn't even understand how to play De La Hiva. So it doesn't make any sense. So it's like, so all that shit that we did prior to that was so useless because I didn't understand how to control the position, how to manage the distance, how, what grips work, why, and, and what you shouldn't be doing. So it, it's, you know, like I said, we're speaking the same language. It's understanding of the position fully and embracing it and how it works left, right, up, down, you know, sideways and backwards, then executing the technique. And, and I think that that's something that really changed, um, you know, my personal game and my understanding of jujitsu. And I think a lot of ways, and I think you can agree with this, um, I think it changed the sport. You know, I think that they, you know, um, when, when I talk to, to Gilbert, we talk about the invention of the 50-50. Um, you know, that's one of the things that they, they contributed to. I'm not going to say that they were the ones that actually invented the 50-50. I've seen it happen before, but no one popularized the position, not the technique, the position like they did. We talk about the Baron Bolo. There's other guys that did it before, um, you know, Marcel Ferreira, Samuel Braga. But those guys and that core group of guys from Atos, they made they popularized it. And it's not a knock to anyone else, but that didn't get popularized to all the other teams. It was it was really them. And and that's those are just a couple to name a few. I think that you know what came out of there was was essentially a, a, the next evolution of jujitsu. And um, it's amazing, you know. I, I I feel pretty blessed to have been um, seen it firsthand. I know you can, you know, attribute to that as well. And you know, we both kind of picked off a lot of cool stuff out of there. Um, from Rio Claro, how where did you kind of end up? How did you end up coming back to the states? What was your next steps there? Um, well, I'll just add something for like when when we talked about that. Cause yeah, this, sure. This one gets fun. It's like the fifty fifty. Yep. And there was days where. The specific training was 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50. And it, it was developed. Hamon was like, okay, Hoffa, this is how you can be Cobrini. You're going to hold him, control him. He's very fast. And you'll, you'll get the sweep and you'll win. But during this one small detail, after the specific training would come, Guy would go study it. Hamon would study it. They'd come back. Hoffa would talk with Guy, Guy would talk with Gilbert, Gilbert would talk with Hamon, Guto Campos, Carlos, everybody would get in there and, okay, well, now you can start to turn to this. Now you can turn into attack. It's not just a, a holding game. It's, there's mm. so many attacks. And um, a lot of play 50-50 now today, but the attacks that we were doing in Rio Claro, Alfred, you've never shown it. I've never shown it. Gilbert's never shown it. Frazado, I was even talking to Frazado about this. It's like you said, it's like all these positions – yeah, other people were doing it for sure. But I don't think there was a room with that many top level people discussing it together as one group rather than, oh, no, I'm doing this. Or it was like, no, no, no. The camaraderie of I want you to be so good 
You know, I want Gilbert. I want Bruno. I want even me. You know, it was always like the expectation of, man, I want you to get this so good so you win. And we yeah. want you to win. I think that's what the difference was, was like that small room could, man, five people, then that's full. Cool. Yeah. Like, but the, the communication level of each other was the key of, of those positions really, um, fruiting into different things, you know, like, gotcha. you know, just, just like the Baron Bowler was like, oh man, the Baron Bowler is just, well, what if the guy does that? Yeah. But then this, and then another world champion black belt. Oh, but you forgot about this. Oh, you forgot about this. This guy would come in. And before you know it, it's like, oh, well, you can't do any of this because the guy will defend. Maybe he would, maybe he never would. But now there's like from one defense, they've come up with 15, 20. Okay. We got to drill all these now. Mm. So now all those defenses, Papa's already drilled every single one of them. So if you go here, he has a defense for your defense. You defense this, he has another one, and then another one, and another one. And, and it just never stopped. The communication never stopped. Gotcha. And, and I feel like that was like, you know, Hamon pushed for that environment. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like teach, you know, like understanding of teaching. Because, man, Hoffman here, fantastic teachers. Yeah. Bruno Frazado. Amazing teacher, Gilbert Burns, amazing teacher, Kalasans, the list goes on. You know, they all like have such good. And I think Hamon really pushed that with everybody to understand that it can always get better. It can always grow into something else. So it was never it was never just like the this is the technique and that's it. It was learning how to learn and learning how to question and and evolve, constant evolution. You know, yeah. I, I I see that for sure. So like I said, Rio Claro, you got to train with, you know, the, 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 the squad. How did you end up, um, you know, with so California? Yeah. Um, Gilbert won, Gilbert won the world's finally though, the major goal, um, 2011, man, probably the best day of my life watching Gilbert win the world's was still like my biggest highlight. You know, it's like, yeah, as you know, how close we are. So it was like yeah. that day, just seeing the work and the, so anyway, he won. He already knew if once he won the world, he was going to MMA. There was, there, it was like, I already knew as soon as he won the world by jiu-jitsu, he had said it, man, I'm going to fight MMA. So here we are. Gilbert won the world. We're back in America. We go to Ruka. We go to the Ruka warehouse. And uh, it's me, Gilbert, Hoppe, Guy, and Bruno Frisato. Um, I just went blank of his name. Um, Man, sorry. Uh, you know, <laughs> Zach. Uh, it was like uh, Belfour. Vitor Belfour. Belfour is in there training. Yep. So we're going in there, Guy and Hoffa, you know, Chris Franco's taking us in there, and, you know, everybody's going to get their Ruka stuff, and, you know, you get to go to the warehouse. It's amazing. It was a great time. Like, we all yep. go like crazy, man. It was phenomenal. I still have stuff from that time. It's, it's crazy. Well, Gilbert's like, man, I'm going to fight MMA. So right then and there, Belfort said, well, I'm in Vegas. Why don't you come to Vegas and, you know, and start training? Okay. So I'm here now. Everybody goes back to Brazil. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm here now, and uh, Gilbert's got to fight in May. And I'm like, oh, shit, man. I don't <laughs> really know what to do. I don't really know. Um, there was some stuff that Gilbert and, and I were, you know, we were done with the team. And, um it was all about MMA now. It wasn't about jujitsu, but mm. man, I didn't want to fight MMA. There's no way. Like, if I had a picture, I'd show Gilbert's first time of putting on gloves and we were beating each other up. It was a horrible experience. Um, so, uh, luckily, um, I had a good relationship with Homolo Bahal. And it just so happened that 2011, Homolo was opening Gracie Baja Northridge. Got it. Gilbert's going to fight MMA. We're in there training with Home Alone. Um, it's a lot of fun. You know, the gym wasn't even open. Uh, it all kind of started with, uh, man, this is funny. This is something nobody knows about this. We were, um, it was Pinguisa, Home Alone, me and Gilbert. Uh, Philippe wasn't Philippe at the time. He was still like before Philippe. Yeah. So we go, Home, uh, Home Alone's like, man, I want to train with Gilbert. Gilbert was like, oh, man, it would be an honor to train home alone. Man, that training session was – me and Philippe started to train a little bit with each other, and it was like 
just watch. So we just yeah, watched yeah. these two. Both of them won the Worlds in that year, you know. So mm. um, it was phenomenal. The training was great. I don't even want to say how it went, but Homo was a monster. And uh, we go home. At the time, right before all this, everybody is in my apartment. I mean, I'm talking the whole team. We're all staying in my room, in my apartment. So we go home. Bruno's like, oh, man, I want to train a home run. Okay. So we go before we open. Bruno trained a home run. Phenomenal. Nobody trained. Everybody just watched these guys train. You know, it was great. Go home. Hoff and Gee were going to go now. Like, oh, man, I want to go train a home run. So it's like. All these amazing people at home were good to train, but um, for whatever reason, it, it kind of stopped and um, everybody went back to Brazil and I was stuck here and I didn't really know what to do. I was like, man, it looks like I'm going to go to Vegas with Gilbert. Uh, um, but then home pulled me aside and was like, man, I'm going to open this gym. You're here. I, I really like for you to be here to teach. Nice. Um, you know, you moved to Brazil, you can't stop, you know, like you went through this process, you know, at the time, especially at the time, you know, nobody, none Americans were really living there. And, and, and I was the only one to be at, at Hill Claro at the time. So I was like, great, man, I'd love to, I'd love to teach, you know, um, the one thing that I feel for me personally is how Hamon made everybody a world champion, but he made me a really good coach because mm. I lived with him. So I got to pick his brain and listen to him every day. So I feel like my coaching skills because of Hamon, you know, he really taught me what you need to do to be a good coach, which is separate than being a, a world champion. You know, you can't be a great coach and a world champion. It's like some of them do it, but it's like to really like create something like that. It was Hamon was taking the time to, man, I'm going to dedicate my whole life to coaching you guys, to making sure I give you a hundred percent of, of, Everybody needs a coach. Golf pros have coaches, you know, yeah. just to help them. And, you know, oh, hey, I'm seeing it from a different eye. I'm back here watching you. I can help you with, oh, man, you keep moving your foot here. Just adjust. And, you know, there's so many things. So, man, thank, thank God Homo gave me a job. And, and that's when um, Gilbert went off. And obviously, you know, he's fighting for the title now. So that worked out for him great. And uh, it worked out great for me to, to teach and, and to – give all this for Gracie Baja Northridge. Nice. You know, that so was, got, that, yeah, that, you know, that was my inevitable next question is how you ended up, you know, coaching and, and everything like that. And you kind of gradually answered it for me, but how, um, I know you're, you're also pretty renowned and, and known for being a, a judo practitioner and a, you know, high level judoka. Was that something that you were doing prior to jujitsu or was it something that you kind of did to kind of complement your jiu-jitsu afterwards? Man, before it was like my closest friend, Chad Estes, his stepdad, Tim Joe from Japan, married his mom, moved to a small town, like kind of like Hill Claro. I grew up in Texas, like Cowboy, Texas, man. What part of Texas? Amarillo, Texas. Amarillo. So, <laughs> Amarillo came Heath Herring, Evan yep. Hanner, um, Paul Bontello, gold medal Olympian, um, Brandon Slay, the Dodgen twins, uh, four time national champions in wrestling. Uh, man, so many great, so many fighters came out of this cause there's nothing to do. And I mean, it's like, yo, Clara, so I don't know the country. It's a, I'm a yeah. country boy. Um, so after school, we go to the town. It's like, it's called the dolphin club. It was the pool. We had to we had to go to the pool, but Tim Joe had to, he had a small judo academy, so we were forced to go there every day. So that, I started with judo when I was a little kid, mm, and okay. we did it, and it was always like, oh man, oh, God, man, Tim Joe was mean, man, like full on, like true, like man, he was a world champion, five time world champion, you know, and, and, and he was also a gymnast. So today he's eighty two and. But he grabs you. Wow. You're like, I'm good. He still has <laughs> ribs, like, and he'll still get out there and move with you and stuff. So it's quite, it's pretty amazing. The guy was, the guy was great. You know, he was great for keeping us out of a lot of trouble. But at the same time, it was, oh man, we really have to do this. Like, come on, man. Like, I just want to hang out and go swim and and just you know do what kids do. And um, so we did that growing up, you know, and and 
whenever we got old enough to realize that there was other things to chase, uh, we kind of kind of forgot about judo, you know. And um, then Carlos Machado moved to Texas, mm -hmm. and that's where jujitsu started because he was in Dallas, and it's only a quick drive to Dallas. And Lovato Jr. was there. Um, Travis Luter was there. Yep. Played Pittman. Um, man, a lot of guys. Uh, James Brown, this other guy who's a black belt from Carlos. A lot of really good guys came from mm -hmm. there. So we were like, well, let's go train this jujitsu stuff. And it was more exciting than judo at the time, obviously. It's way more fun and fast paced. And, and again, we didn't really take it serious. We just started training and it was fun. And then we'd go back to judo here and there and move. And, you know, we were competing and stuff. And um, Carl Geis was a guy who's a lot of people from USA Judo know he's amazing. He passed away. And when that happened, it was just kind of like, eh, like, eh, whatever, you know, and then life happens and I ended up moving to California and then, you know, I got back into it. And so, so, so Judo's always been like between me and you and this podcast, Judo's still my favorite. Well, I love Judo. I mean, I love wow. it. if, um, I, I should have, should have one, one regret that I have is I should have taken it to, I should have went the route with judo that I did with jiu-jitsu. I should have spent my my whole time in judo just because, um, well, I don't know. Maybe I'm lying. You know, I don't know. I can't really say that because jiu-jitsu has been good for me also. You know, I've got to meet so many people, but um, that's where my judo came from. So do, you, young. do you feel that uh, maybe, um, you know, the judo style takedown game is something that just kind of gets a little too overlooked with the whole modern jujitsu, um, you know, trends that are out there right now. Is it something that you're trying to, you know, insist on with your guys at your academy? What do you think about judo in, in, in the modern game? Because, I mean, certain guys you see, they ha you could see high-level judo. They may not even train judo, but they're doing judo-type throws. Like guys like Rodolfo, I don't know if he's a judo black belt, but he's got some damn good judo throws and you know there's a lot of teams like that that have really you know a lot of high level black belts, especially in the heavier divisions they have some strong judo you know shanji's a guy that's been training judo a long time um but it's something that you don't you know it's it's once in a while you see it still there and a lot of times it's it's just quickly pulling de la Hiva. so is it's uh, you know what do you think of weight, isn't it i think it's the weight the heavier the guy the yeah they want to pull guard nobody wants a heavy guy on top of them and, and like when we do, when we talk about Solo and Shanji is they, they don't just train judo for jiu-jitsu. And they train with Flavio Canto. They, they were yep. training judo. So, and, they, you know, I spent a lot of time with Travis. So it's like they understand the gripping of judo, which really helps for jiu-jitsu. So I don't really try to teach the guys, you know, like we have a big judo program here. You know, we have Hugo Legrand, my friend from France. You know, he's an, he's an Olympic medalist, one of the best 77, 73 kilos, sorry, in the world. But we don't, we, what I teach the guys, even when they're pulling guard, is the idea of winning the grips. So the grip sequence in judo is super different than jiu-jitsu, you know, because you, in jiu-jitsu you have time to fail. Yeah. In judo, you don't have time to fail. You have to grip, move, and go because that you have one attack. And if that attack fails, that person knows, oh, I'm going to defend this grip. And his kazushi will be off the rest of the fight. So the opportunity is dropped. You have a few different guard passes. You have a few different sweeps off the same. You can change grips a lot. But in judo, it's like you need to control sleeve and collar and move you know like kazushi and stuff so winning the inside grip for me what i teach the guys from my judo background is making sure you win the inside grip so the grip will always win no matter what the position or concept you're going to do beat the grip like a lot of times you don't necessarily need to break the grip you can beat it with the better grip and move around that so mm -hmm. you move your body to the grip rather than trying to get a different grip for your body so it's like win the best grip your best this is your grip, have grip strength. Understand the grip strength's not from your hands, it's from your back, it's not from your fingers, you know, not letting your arms extend because then you don't have strength. Your, your grip comes from your lats, you know, to control. And um, winning that, and once you win that, now they it's hard for them to gain that distance because you have a inside grip. If you're on the outer grip, 
it, your elbow is going to be in the wrong spot. You can't stop that. So as soon as you win, look, you have this ability to open the elbow. Now they're weaker, defend their grip. Now they can't set up their grip, and then you can start moving your body. So I like to use my judo knowledge to help them understand, like, win these grip wars, and now you're already in a more successful position to win. So I don't really throw big throws and stuff because, as you know, if you want to be, like, doing big throws, man, you know, your uchikomis have to be 500 in the morning, 500 in the afternoon, another 500 at night to get the timing, you know, so it's, mm-hmm. it's different. But, um, you know, like, if you look at uh, Salo, man, Salo has an Ipon Seonagi that's, like, yeah, and he's very patient about it because he understands, I'll win the grip, I'm going to set up my body and I have one time. One and it's done, you know. So I have a really good Yashi, so I set up everything off uh, the Kumikata. So it's like kum- grip fighting. So I set every all my foot sweeps, and everybody know a foot sweep, probably everybody I've ever trained with at least once. And it's it's off the grip. I get you off the grip, beating you with the grip, you know. So I, I feel like that's where the judo comes from here in the academy. And, and it's so nice because Kenny, man, Kenny has a closed guard from the old school days. is like phenomenal. Isaac is as technical as they come with a beautiful guard. And um, my strengths come from takedown and, and being on top, you know, with the system. And, um, I feel like everybody needs to know how to do a takedown. So that, because you can score off of it, you know, understanding like now the way the rules are, one person pulls, instead of playing this double guard pull, if you stand up, it's like, oh, I can use my judo to make him pull put myself in a good spot mm. so that I have success for transitions. I don't know if that makes sense at all, but yeah, no, no, I, 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 I kind of <laughs> listen, man, I, I, I get it. I'm geeking out here and I'm, you know, loving every second of it. Um, one of the things that I, you know, obviously you mentioned your judo and you're, you know, you're on top. And I think a lot of people know you as a, as a really good, um, having, having a really good passing game as well. Um, so it's a two part question. A, did it, you know how much of that came from Hamon? And B, do you have like a general philosophy on passing that maybe is kind of unique to you, or just like a general philosophy in, on passing in general that maybe uh, is a little different than than the average person? And it's like we said before, a lot of people they you know it's it's more you know they focus on techniques and they just keep layering techniques as opposed to positions and understanding what the person's doing on body and their position so you know like i said two-part question a where did a lot of your passing come from and b um what's your kind of general philosophy on passing you know kind of generally speaking uh everything came all of my whole jiu-jitsu of today came from hill club so okay uh it came from hamon a lot of it came from gilbert you know like which came from hamon a lot of it came from Guy. How, how do we do this? And, you know, and, and Guy being there to really help and Hoffa and, and you know, Kalasanz is really good passing too I, in the academy. But the the whole system, you know, so like you said, like, man, my, my philosophy is thank, thank you for the guys for really opening my brain of don't teach a pass, you know. So mm. like my DVD for BJJ Fanatics is like, it's, it's that, it's um, – I look at it as a geometrical system. You have a round, you have square, and then you have a triangle. A lot of times you can go around, right? So you can pass from far, middle, and close. Yep. And then if you look at it like if you're fluid and the guy's moving a lot, you have to get your body and move like a ball, you know, and pass. A lot of times the guy's guard's so good, you need to be like square with like a lot of pressure, hold, 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 and release. So then you have a round square. And then sometimes like Leandro Lowe, for me, it's like very triangular. It's like cutting straight through. So what I try to teach and, and what I really think about jiu-jitsu now, it's like when you move, move as one whole entity. So your hands aren't for passing, your body is. Your hands for attacking. And I learned that from Hamon. Mm. And, and from Hoff and Fergie and, and from Gilbert, it's like you need to transition. So if my hands are going behind as I'm passing, my transition is not going to be there. So I need my hands to transition and bring my body so that I'm constantly like, 
Like, uh, for instance, like if, if you like to take the back, you're not passing the guard. The guard is just a milestone. To get, it's just in the way. You have to start to finish on the back. So the guard pass is to set up the back. The back so tick, yeah. Using your, okay, I'm going to start here. Get the movement going with the Toriando, right? Because everything's based off the Toriando. Because once you start getting the Toriando, it's my body's taking over. Then I'm getting the right grip to be successful for the transition. So I'm always trying to teach people to be prepared for the transition. Set yourself up for the transition. Don't set yourself up for, oh, I'm just going to pass, pause, yeah, recover, move. Man, guys are too good, man. They're way too good. It's, it's, it's changed. The game has changed. And I think, man. sorry to cut you off, that was a, that was a huge – eye opener for me because I started training jujitsu 97 and you know the, the the sequence of training was you know take down or sweep to get on top pass stabilize side or stabilize knee on belly or or go to mount whereas when when Hoff and Guy came and it was more like pass to get to the back and it was this whole other like wow like because and then I was like, well, why don't you guys go to side? And they're like, well, think of it. All the person has to do is, you know, hip out once, and now they're recovering half guard, or they're that much closer to it. So if you get to the back where their hips are facing the complete opposite direction, and you're behind their hips, you can now take their back. They can't recover guard, and you've op you've optimized the situation. Like you've, you you know, you're in a much better position. They can't face you. They can't see you because you're on their back. So it's a much easier path. And that was a, another thing, like for me, like just their whole philosophy. And I'm sorry to interrupt you, by the way, because no, you're, no, 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 but it's just the whole philosophy. You know, I remember Hafan Gee was like, you don't want to get stuck in the guard, you know? And I think you're kind of hitting the nail on the head here. It's like, why do you, like, I remember Gee was saying to me, like, why do you want to battle? One of the if you have a great guard player, why do you want to battle in his guard? So if the if the guy pulls guard, you're not going through it. You got to go around. You got to go around before he establishes the guard. Yeah. Not There's letting him get his grip. Guard. Exactly. And 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 you know and like the shin passing, the shin to shin passing, and all these different things. It was just like, holy shit! It's such a smart principle different method different techniques of the principle and application but the principle and the concept was so brilliant but it was so simple you know but so yet so advanced <laughs> i wish every day i wish i could do it like that you know and, and understanding your body type yeah um and then adjusting from training with homos homo just just is just is gonna choke you there's no he's gonna choke you like yeah that's you're gonna get choked <laughs> yeah i mean that's homo so I've, I've been able to take a lot from Homo and then everything from Yo Claro and and I don't I'm not I'm not fast enough to take the back so you know I'm not as fast anymore like I was as younger you know I'm getting you know as you as your body changes you kind of adapt you know like so it is that it's like okay the guy pulls I already need to be ahead of him because we never want to go backwards if I pass the foot I'm one step to the knee if I pass the knee that means I'm controlling the hip. From there, I can stop. I can pause. He will start giving me my avenues of if he hipscapes, I can change direction. If he wants to roll, now I'm attacking the back or the turtle. If he comes back, I go to the on belly. Then I change the side. And you're constantly in a flow where you're not stopped like, oh, hold. It's okay. Here's my start. As I start, he's going to do two or three things. So you're already like, if he does this, I go here. If he does this, I go here. If he does this, I'm going here. And your ultimate goal is the position that you love to be in. I like to be in uh, side control hand in the collar. Mm. Right? Or I like to trap the arms with my knees. Where Hoffa or Guy are going to be, man, I'm going to pass. I'm going to make you turtle because that's the only way you can escape. But I'm already ahead of you. I'm already, yeah. I'm already getting my grips in. Same with Gilbert. If you watch Gilbert, Gilbert Burns was like, He's going to take you down. He's going to trap you. He's going to get to your back. So there, it was always a keep your body. Don't overextend because then you're slow. So everything is by step by step. If my hand goes, my body goes. 
If you're going to escape, I'm not going to try to hold you. I'm going to release and change direction. So you're constantly being able to think ahead rather than defense, defense, defense. Once you start that attack, everything you do is attack. Defend with an attack. Defend mm-hmm. again with an attack until you get to the position that you want and you're not in, you're not in stress. You're never like, oh, you're always, okay, I started the movement. I'm already controlling. Now he's going to get into my system. And, and I feel like that's what Hill Claro is like. I'm going to put you in my system, but I know my system better than you. So as you're trying to figure out the system, I'm already like four and five, as they say, you know, you're already way ahead because you know where mm-hmm. the system ends. And I feel like that's what we got from Hill Claro is that I'm going to put you into the system and I'm going to force you to play the system. But it's our system. So it's almost like giving the guy a video game saying, here, play me, but I already have all the cheat codes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So yeah, I feel like that's, um, and I don't know if I'm right or wrong, you know, but just for me personally, I feel like that's the, uh, that's what I gathered the most from that is like understanding you need to have a system in place and try to just, again, ask and grow and talk about the positions. And well, this guy, there's always that one guy that does something that he should never do and just throws up the whole system. And you're like, oh man, well, there you go. We got to start dealing with that now. And, <laughs> and yeah, then it starts to grow and the system just keeps going. And, you know, that's why there's so many guys that are coming up now from a lot of those guys that are phenomenal, you mm-hmm. know, like phenomenal. Yeah. So um, one of the things I wanted to ask you is it's, it's something that uh, Vito Shaolin said, you know, obviously he's an OG, one of the you know greatest of all time. And you talk about the system that you teach. And one of the things that Shaolin said was, you know, students nowadays are learning jujitsu in the worst time ever. Not the coronavirus time, but in the TikTok generation, you know, walking into jujitsu with the cell phone, with TikTok jujitsu, YouTube jujitsu, Instagram videos. And it's great to have all that accessible information, but nothing really substitutes, you know, the, the time on the mat and the exploration. Like, you know, for yourself, you know, you went to Rio Claro to get on the mats with the best guys. You didn't just watch an instructional. How do you deal with the student that, you know, is coming into your gym and, you know, we every every gym has this, you know, the know-it-all, the guy that's like, well, I just saw this new so-and-so instructional and, you know, he said that you got to do a leg lock with the lapel this way or and it's just like, okay, but this is our style and this is what I'm teaching you. How, what what do you think about that statement about like the whole TikTok generation, and also how do you kind of deal with with those guys? <laughs> because um, it's a question of, as myself as a coach, yeah. I've had a couple of those guys, so I ask everyone like, "What do you guys do?" Um, just so I can give them good responses, you know, and good advice back. But uh, interested when you to hear what judo, and that's what I love about judo and the IJF and the way it's yep. structured is you don't see these guys, you don't see the highest level judokas in between rounds with their phones. You don't see that because you're training at a natural, a national training center with a whole national team of coaches and doctors. And it's very professional. So there's no phones anywhere. So I use that a lot as an example is, is guys. And I have it in the rules. I don't want to see your, your phone's not allowed on the mat. If it's on the mat, I'm going to throw it out. Like this is time for you to get rid of your life and to put that phone down and, and get, yeah. get something out of it. If you compete or you just do it for fun, it's, that's that time to be with camaraderie. Like, and, and, uh, and when I talk to competitors and, and I like to say this is I was like, if you look at the generation, uh, we'll take Salo first. Salo is a what? Six time world champion. Yeah. He wasn't worried about his phone and Instagram. He didn't care. Sean, still doesn't. He still, still probably does. <laughs> Sean G has won over and over and over and over. Then you have Homeworld. Then you have Andre Galval. You have that generation of guys who, who, if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be where we are today, in my mind. Mm. So now you have all the guys today. Not, none of them are really winning like your division for six years in a row or being in the final six years in a row, like Andre, Homeworld, Sean G. 
Sala. Yeah, good like, point. And there's a reason behind it is there were like, they're not worried about their phones or their, it was a work ethic. It was, man, after you won the world champion, the next day you're training for the next world champion. So when I look at these guys today and they're young and it's like, okay, in between rounds, you want to fix your hair, take a photo. It's like, man, nobody cares about that right now. Because you can look good all day long, but you got to go and you got to win. Mm -hmm. For me, like, and, and you know, like I said, I'm not a world champion by any means, but being around that environment, I know what it takes. Being around Homolo, being around Gilbert, Hamon, and, and like I said, Hamon made me a world champion coach, not a world champion jiu-jitsu. So I look at that and I tell the guys, if you want to be a champion, your phone's not going to make you a champion. That mat is going to make you a champion. That eating right is going to make you a champion. That thinking right is going to be all that other stuff. Again, it's a look at Hoffa, Guy, four-time world champion, six-time world champion. They weren't worried about their phones until they got home, decompressed, and then they were like talking to friends, not we're training really hard this round. Man, yeah. you didn't have time because you were dead because, like, and put in the home, work. Watching Homo, I mean, Homo was like a machine, like a machine. You turned it on, Andre Gaval still to this day. He's a machine. He turns it on, and you don't see, you don't see them like posting. Now you see Homo and stuff, but Homo's more retired now, and he's posting yeah. just so you can see like what he's doing and what he's been doing. And same with Andre, you know, he's posting like, look, this is what I've been doing, but they were already there. They've already been there and they've already won over and over and over and over. They don't get excited. Lucas Lepre, Marcelo Garcia, they don't, they're not excited about, oh, yeah, man, I've got six world champions. Yeah, no big deal. Yeah. Like, because that was expected of them. So the younger generation, man, they're good. They are so good. The jiu-jitsu now is phenomenal. Like, But they are not worried about um, – Man, it's it's a tough world, you know, because you know, like it's almost like they're it's almost guys. like they're not thinking of the long term legacy as much yeah. as the you know, and I'm not trying to knock anyone, but I feel I I from what you're saying, and I kind of agree, and I feel that way too. It's almost like they're not thinking long term. They're not looking at the long career that they could have. I'm not saying all of them, but I don't see that they they I don't feel that vibe from them that they are they're looking so long ahead it's almost like i want to get that one world and the world title and, and and coast you know and yeah. um it's different time for sure and and you yeah. know you mentioned right. you mentioned andre it's like i was i was looking at some magazines i have here the other day and it was like 2004 was the first time i saw him compete as a brown belt at worlds and he destroyed everyone and i was just thinking like 2005 and now it's 2020 he's still at the top of the game even though he retired last year but he's still he could go to IBJJF Worlds if it was let's say theoretically this year he'd probably win you know like he'd probably win easily like he's still in the top of his shape technically he's still ahead of the game and it's just you know I, I don't know if the newer generation are looking at that long term career I don't think that they're interested in that anymore but There's I mean distractions now right There's yeah distract those guys like again like Andre exactly I'll take home low. Um, as a story of training hard three times a week, three times a day, every day, a Sunday. This is, man, this is back, so this is even before I went, this is 2010, on a Sunday. Hey, Jay, come by, you know, this dude, I've never seen this still to this day, man, and I swear to God I'm not lying. Homo sat on his butt, grabbed a rope. He climbed a rope up and down without putting his butt on the ground ten times. Wow. Ten times. Then he went and did his other circuit crazy training. And then we trained like six rounds. And this is Sunday. It's like resting. <laughs> yeah. You know? um, they didn't have the distractions because, again, they wanted to win one, two, three, four. But now it's like you have TikTok, you have Call of Duty, Twitch, and, and girls, and, and Instagram. And, oh, I need to show my Instagram. And, like, but then you have guys like Shaolin, like, they're not they're, – Man, that guy Shaolin, one of the best ever. Yeah. He's not on Instagram. Yeah. He's focusing on trying to give that lifestyle. And, and I'm not knocking anybody, you know, because no, no, no. guys who are on that, you know, like look at Gordon Ryan. Gordon Ryan's arguably the best no-gi fighter in the whole world, man. And his Absolutely. Instagram is like it's like a comedian show every single day, you know? It's like <laughs> um 
He's attacking trolls left, right, and center. Yeah, like, <laughs> up and down. You know? And then you got Craig Jones, who's hilarious. Kid Dell. It's amazing guys, man. Like Craig Jones was probably the nicest guy I've ever met in my life. He came here, did a takedown seminar with me, like just a private. Like, hey Jay, we show me like the get the guy's phenomenal, man. Like yeah. Gordon's phenomenal, you know. Yeah. But I just I don't like the I just wish, you know, it is a martial arts to begin with. And and I know Connor McGregor started this whole thing and he's a genius. He's very witty and and it was good, you know, but it's not for everybody. And I feel like even some people that are they're getting lost and that's not even them. And they feel like that's the new, like, you gotta, gotta, gotta. But do you have to? I don't know. I mean, I'm older yeah. too, maybe. Maybe I'm just an old grumpy guy. And I prefer to just be like, man, respect each other. It's a sport. You know? You're not beating each other up. You're going to fight. And then you may win on Saturday and lose on Sunday and then win again on Monday. And and, uh, you know, you, you fight each other for your whole life, you know, from when you're competing, you're competing against the same guy from white all the way to black and to continue to fight. You, you got to have some friendship there. You got to have yeah. some, some mutual like, man, we are like, we are very close. Like, I know a lot of stuff about you. Um, I, and I like that. Like, I miss that. Like, uh, when it was like, I mean, nobody's talking, you know, everybody's, I, we need to kind of go back there to build more. For me personally, to to get the kids that are coming up, you know, like some of the guys from AOJ, you know, you don't hear them talking. There's some of the they're, they're going to be the next, you know, like yeah, you know, there's a few guys in there that are man, you don't hear a peep from them. No, they are unbelievable. Um, you know, guys from Optos, guys from Alliance, guys from Gracie Ball. I mean, there's so many guys that that aren't in the limelight that aren't because they're not doing that. I feel like they are getting overshadowed, but like, but man, they're good, you know, and, and yeah. I kind of feel like they don't need to be pushed and, but it's a double-edged sword, you know, like you need that. And Instagram is the new world. You need that to promote yourself. I mean, look, man, I don't promote myself on Instagram. I just got one when we opened the gym and I barely got like 3,000 followers and I don't even know how to work the dang thing and look at this computer <laughs> we try to get on here. I had three different computers going. <laughs> I'm, oh, man, I don't know what I'm doing. And, uh, maybe I'm just living in a dinosaur world and and, uh, no, you know, I, I think it's, I think it's, you know, times are changing and, you know, but again, it's like, kind of like you said, like at the end of the day, it is still a martial art. Uh, I, I, I do believe that, you know, um, even I remember Edwin Najmi said this best is like, you know, the, the, the baby that doesn't cry doesn't get fed, you know? So I think as a fighter, as a professional fighter, if that's your career, if you want to make money from super fights and all this other stuff, I think you got to do something. Um, whether you, whether you choose to cross the line with, you know, talking crap, that's not for everyone, but you got to do something. There's some guys out there that, um, are so talented and like, even for me, like, listen, I, it took on I me, mean, I had, I had just, you know, get a lot of courage to even start a podcast. I'm so shy about shit. Like I don't post videos of my instructions cause I'm like, I always think I'm going to do it and people are going to hate it. So it takes a lot of courage just to do that stuff. But I think like some people, they're so good and they don't say anything. And, and, and it's, it's for that reason. They got to, you know, it's almost like they need coaches on uh, or management, you know, on how to just how to handle their careers. And I think some of them try to do it and it comes off very disingenuous. Others do it too much. And then it just looks hokey. And then there's some guys that just don't say anything. Like you look at a guy like Kalazan's, one of the most deadliest guys in the world, you know, that guy's a straight killer. Doesn't say a word. He'll just awesome. post like, like he'll post a picture and he's just like great training today. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's knock to knock him. That but when you talk is... to him, but that's him, that's him. Like he's a quiet guy. He's not you know a crazy, you know, it was like people forget that. And that's what I love about Edwin. You know, I've known Edwin since he was 15 years old. You know, Edwin started a, a blog before blogs were cool in jujitsu. Yeah. Like, uh, what was it before the – what was it, man? Was Best of BJJ? Best of was, BJJ, man. I was yeah. Edwin Najmi at 16 years old yeah. training. Instead of going to his phone, he went and wrote. And I feel like him doing that at that time, why Edwin was so dominant, was because he was he was in it. Like, every yeah. second, every day, like, all the time, he was in it. Like, and man, Edwin was a – Edwin was a Danielson, you know, like – um, you know, again, we kind of forgot we didn't get to talk about some of the guys and like that weren't like black belts at the time, like the Nilsson, who was by far one of the best jujitsu fighters 
you know, like he was MMA early, but man, he was if he was competing today, he would be at the highest level. And even Absolutely, Ronaldo and um, but Edwin, you know, Edwin was like that. I remember he would train and go and get on his computer and start talking about best of BJJ and studying everybody, watching videos, and and then he stopped, you know, and then he got onto social media. And, yeah, um, but he, I mean, he was he was one of the that kid, he was, man, that guy knew everything about a computer. I remember I'll tell you, help me, please. I have no idea. What, what is that? Oh, Jay, you're crazy. Just hit that button. No. Like, <laughs> you know, yeah, so. he was, he was very, um, like I said, he was one of the guys taught me that expression. And, uh, you know, I remember seeing him compete as a blue belt and, and, you know, maybe in the beginning he let his actions on the mat, you know, uh, speak for him and they spoke volumes, you know, he had a lot of fast submissions, you know, before I remember he was really big into ankle locks and total, you know, and, and foot locks back in the day. Uh, and then the flying triangles came and then, you know, I think as, as he kind of got up to the ranks, then he started to be a little more vocal out there. And, you know, he's one of the guys that, um, you know, he, he does not disrespectful at all. He does a lot of, you know, branding and, puts himself out there a lot on social media, but it's in a pretty positive way. Yeah, he I don't never really see anything bad or really bad. No, Unless you attack Edwin, Edwin's the Yeah, best. he's not coming back. He's not no, he's that's not his style. Can be, man. He, he's, yeah. Unless you personally attack Edwin, then Edwin can be pretty nasty. Edwin, Edwin can be pretty mean, you know like yeah. <laughs> Edwin can feel like a little feisty when some of the guys have, have attacked him and stuff. And uh, yeah. But if you don't attack Edwin man, he's he's a great dude and he's, he's a chill guy. He he he's He's the guy I'd like to see more of that. Like Edwin promotes himself very, very well. And, yep. And again, the sport is obviously getting way more professional, right? It is getting professional. The guys are making money that was never around four no. five years ago, you know, like yep. at all. So now maybe it is where they do need some managers and and people kind of controlling their path because they do need that. They are young, you know. You got to think where some of these guys are like in their early twenties, you know. So yes, they are very young. You know, Gordon Ryan is not very old, if you think about it. No. Man, freaking, the guy's a f like phenomenal, you know? And he's um, doing financially, he's doing amazing too. Yeah. So, yeah. But he's, but he's an exception. He's an exception. He's he's one of the few guys that kind of understood how to how to play the game, win it, and, 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 and make the bank, you know, which is not a lot of people really know how to do, unfortunately. Uh, but... I mean, um, on that at BJJ Fanatics. So. That's it. That's yeah. it. We should... BJJ yeah, management, BJJ yeah. management DVD, BJJ uh, branding DVD. That's yeah, coming out. That. For sure, I need to brand myself. I'm not, <laughs> I got Kenny and everybody in here with thousands blue checks, and I got a friend of blue check, and I can't even get myself a blue check. You know, it's like I don't even know. It's like, hey, I can get you one, but I, I have nothing. So um, <laughs> that's funny. You know, and like you said, I'm always nervous, and you know, it's always politics with being here plowing and then going with, with uh, Homolo, and you know, yeah. I finally did a DVD, and and I got to give credit, you know, I, I didn't, it's not me, you know, like, I got that information from these guys, so it's like, I got to give these guys the credit, you know, I got to give Hamon the credit, because if it wasn't for Hamon, I wouldn't even have this information to even share with people, and, um, and that's like where my DVD kind of, when I, whenever I was asked to do one, it was like, oh man, I'm, you know, like, this isn't even mine, it's like, I was taught this and I'm going to share it, but go to AOJ.com and you're going to see stuff from like famous guys, you know? So it's mm -hmm. kind of like, sometimes it's a little like hard to, I know the information, but I've never won a major tournament like that. You know, I mean, I'm a third place guy and every, the world's I've been third place and Pan Am's I've been third place and judo I win, but for some reason, jujitsu, I'm third place and I'm the loser. Nice way of saying you're the loser, but, um, yeah, man, it's like it's tough to these kids these days, and and the way the jiu-jitsu is going these days, and how can you control them because they are making a lot more money than the guys of the past. So you can say, well, you guys didn't make any money, and I'm making really good money. So who's mm -hmm. right? And who's wrong? You know, you can't really. Yeah, it's hard to say who's right and wrong because it's maybe the guys now are right and the guys then weren't doing and they should have been doing, or maybe the solos and the guys who really helped this this you know and Hamon and Shaolin and boy you know all the guys from that time you know uh Margarita the guys that forget yeah. the Margaritas anymore I mean Caprito and Pedipano and 
Teddy Chumpo and Jacare. People are jumping. Yeah. I mean, come on. Right. It's it's crazy. It's crazy. Kids these yeah. days. Kids these days. Yeah. Well, like let, should know those people. Yeah. Well, that's just, that's something I try to really put out there on you know my my media my content i try to do a lot of bga history pieces i'm putting out old matches as you know your 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 breakdowns because you do break down all the old fights man yeah like, oh man that was like nino shimbri's fighting uh margarita like you broke yeah like, come on man that was like that was yeah like, there's some there's some gold there there's some gold in the old stuff in the old matches and i try to put that out there best i can but listen uh, man we're, we're running out of time we could i know we didn't even touch on like any of the stuff we wanted to but i could geek out and talk jujitsu with you all day um for those of you guys watching at home uh you guys can check jason out at meraki bjj.com is that the is that the site yeah it's the website yeah meraki bjj Okay. And then uh, Jay Hunt BJJ is your Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> I have, so I remember looking you up as Jason Hunt. I could never find it, but it's Jay yeah, Hunt Jay, BJJ. I don't know if I could change or it just seems like Jay Hunt. BJ. Everybody calls me Jay Hunt. So it's like, ah, Jay Hunt BJJ, you know? Stick with what's cool. That's cool. Yeah. But uh, yeah, guys, check him out. If you're ever in the Brentwood, Beverly Hills area, go to Meraki BJJ. Him and Kenny Florian have a really nice dojo there. Once things are better with the coronavirus situation, Hopefully I'll be able to come out and finally get to train with you guys and I'll uh, get my ass cooked by you guys. But uh, man, Jason, it's like I said, it's been, it's been fun sharing stories and listening to your stories. Anything you want to say before we uh, sign off here? Uh, just thank you. Thank you. It's always nice to talk to you. Like, so we've been friends for a long time. We've seen a lot of things and I like to be able to share some stuff that maybe some people of today generation, they don't know about some of the guys, you know, it's nice to be able to share that. So thank you. Right. All right, brother. Thanks so much, uh, Jason, once again. And for everyone watching home, like I said, go check them out if you're ever in the area. And uh, thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next episode of Ricardo Blea BGJ Podcast. Take care, guys. Be safe, guys. Thank you.